welcome everyone today to the Cato Institute for this conversation on the topic of government censorship by proxy. Uh, right off the bat, let me just note that sadly, one of our panelists, Kristen, came down ill last night, so we will miss her here today. Um, but we will carry on um, with this discussion that is really even more relevant today than actually when we first started planning the event, as you are all probably aware that the Supreme Court has decided to take up this issue of what is government censorship by proxy, and they'll be discussing that in there. They'll be taking that up in the next term. Just to quickly introduce myself, um, my name is David Nacera, and I serve as the Fellow for Free Expression and Technology here at the Cato Institute, where I handle issues of social media content policies, attempts to regulate online expression, and how we can encourage a culture of free expression both online and offline. Um, previous to Cato, I was part of Meta's content policy team that was responsible for crafting the community standards, what you can and cannot say on Meta's platforms. In this role, I also made final decisions on content that were escalated because they were either difficult for reviewers to reach that decision at scale or because of the high profile nature of the content. And so when it comes to today's topic, this is one that I'm personally familiar with. When developing policies, there were times when what governments were doing or threatening to do, this was brought to my attention and I had to figure out how to proceed. Did my team craft a policy that is easiest to enforce, and ensures user expression, or should we remove more speech to align with government requests and maybe fend off government regulation? Similarly, when governments report content to us, there were times when we felt pressure to reach a conclusion that might be different than we would otherwise reach. Some of our policies explicitly require government um, perspectives, such as reports from law enforcement about potential veiled threats. But how should we handle gov potential g government bias or suppression that could come through those channels? And of course, this is where the rub is. Sometimes companies legitimately want government input to help provide expertise, context, or knowledge that's just simply not available in-house. There are important conversations that happen between companies and government that are merely voluntary exchanges of information about important topics or simple requests that might not have any other coercive intent. And so the challenges of governments using social media or any other companies for that matter as proxies for suppressing speech, the challenge here is how do we determine when the government communications cross that line? When are they coercive and controlling or wh when are they just mere requests and information sharing? Based on my knowledge of being inside a tech company and having seen things like the Twitter files and other disclosures, government interactions with tech companies have grown substantially and so we need to figure out how we're going to handle this and that's what we're here to discuss today. What is going on with government pressures against speech? Why is it a problem? And how as a society can we handle it? And so today I'm happy to be joined by one of the authors of a new Cato paper, Shining a Light on Censorship, How Transparency Can Curtail Government social media censorship and more, and you can pick up a copy of that on the outside, and it's certainly available on the website as well. Andrew Grossman uh, is an adjunct scholar here at the Cato Institute. He practices appellate and constitutional litigation in the Washington, D.C. office of Baker Hostetler. He has written widely on law and finance, bankruptcy law, national security law, and the constitutional separation of powers. He is a frequent advisor to Congress on complex legal and policy issues, particularly con relating to constitutional limits on federal power. He has testified numerous times between House and Senate Judiciary Committees, and in addition to articles in professional publications, his commentaries appeared in dozens of journal uh, uh, periodicals and newspapers. And he's, in addition to being a frequent uh, co uh, commentator on uh, radio and television, he has written several amici briefs that have appeared before the Supreme and uh, Federal Courts of Appeals. He is a graduate of Dartmouth, the University of uh, Pennsylvania's Fellows Institute of Government, and the George Mason University of Law, School of Law. And so with that, Andrew, I'm gonna turn it over to you to describe your paper and, and what you found. Thank you, David. And thank you as well to the Cato Institute uh, for hosting this event, as well as to Cato again and Cato's Will Dufield uh, for encouraging our work uh, on this topic. Um, I think it's important to start with the, real, the recognition that we currently enjoy what I think is the most wide open communications and media environment in the world's history. Every citizen now has a megaphone to reach untold numbers 
of readers, listeners, and viewers on the internet in a way that was simply never possible even in the recent past. Paradoxically, at the same time, we also face, as a quantitative matter, more government interference with speech than at any other time in our nation's history. Simply going by the numbers, more Americans are being censored, more speech is being censored and suppressed by government actions than has ever been the case in the past. But this isn't primarily the old kind of censorship. We're not talking about book bans. We're not talking about other types of traditional prior restraints on speech, on publications. Um, what we're talking about is a phenomenon that I call government censorship by proxy. I'll freely admit it's not a great name. Other people call it jawboning, and I'm certainly interested if others have suggestions for what to, just, what to call this phenomenon. But what we're talking about by this is something different than the government reaching out itself, acting as a censor to, cur to curtail a speech act. Instead, what we're talking about is the government exerting pressure, sometimes coercion, sometimes other forms of, of, of force, uh, to service providers who facilitate speech and facilitate other types of conduct in our economy. So that may include social media companies, when the government requests that a user be deplatformed or that a particular post be removed. Or it may involve, for example, the provision of financial services to disfavored speakers and people uh, whose associational activities uh, are opposed by government officials. That's why we call this censorship by proxy. The government is undertaking or it has the aim of engaging in traditional type censorship, but rather than doing itself, doing that itself, is working through a third party private proxy, the service provider. Today I'm going to discuss three aspects of this. First, we'll talk about the nature of the problem and how we got to this point. Second, I think it's important to focus on why this is a problem. How does it impact our rights, civil discourse, and ultimately our democracy? And then third and most important, what can be done about it? There have been a number of proposals, and there is, of course, as David mentioned, ongoing litigation that targets this issue. We have a novel proposal that tries to shine a light on what it is that the government or actors are doing, how it is that they're acting to suppress speech, um, but also recognizes that governments do appropriately participate in the marketplace of ideas. So let's start with the nature of the problem. I want to be clear that what we're talking about isn't exactly social media censorship, as that term is commonly used. And it, it, what we're talking about is both broader and narrower than that. It's broader because this phenomenon of censorship by proxy, it goes beyond social media. There have been examples of the government um, interacting with service providers across the economy um, to target and uh, punish disfavored speakers and disfavored organizations. So it's not just social media. But also, this is, this, what we're not talking about is the, pro is the decisions of private actors about what types of speech they would care to publish uh, and what types of customers they would care to provide services to. Those questions, of course, uh, implicate very important policies and are, are centrally important to the practice of free speech culture uh, in our country. But at the same time, in my view, they implicate very different issues and in some respects are at least less severe than government censorship of speech. The history of this type of, sense, of, of this type of phenomenon goes back many years. In fact, it probably is just about as old as government. So long as government has power to compel uh, private actors to act, it always has the opportunity to use that power to coerce things beyond what is specifically authorized by law. The phenomenon of jaw, what's called jawboning uh, was first applied to actions by the Kennedy administration, and particularly by President Kennedy, uh, in 1962 to sway uh, steel producers uh, against uh, moving forward with a price hike that, might, that would have added to the overall uh, inflation across the economy at that time. He gave a speech pointedly targeting the producers and calling them out, um, and his Department of Justice uh, sent uh, inquiries and, in some cases, threats uh, to steel companies uh, so as to affect their pricing decisions. And that quickly became labeled as jawboning. 
But that was sort of a, what I would think of as a primitive example of this phenomenon because it didn't exactly involve the proxy concept. I think where that first arose was in 2013 during the Obama administration in what was known as Operation Choke Point. This was an initiative by the Department of Justice and federal financial regulators to pressure banks to drop a variety of businesses that were disfavored by the administration. It included firearms dealers, tobacco shops, and payday lenders. It also included specifically speech-based targeting. The FDIC's official list of groups of, of uh, bank customers of concern included groups publishing, quote, racist materials, uh, as well as producers of pornography. Operation Choke Point, when it came to light and through litigation, was eventually terminated. But the same phenomenon of the government working through private actors to do what it couldn't do on its own uh, re-arose uh, in about 2017, following the election of President Trump. There, the government's efforts were focused more tightly on speech. Specifically, the government was, began focusing on so-called election interference, misinformation, disinformation, all those words that we now understand the government uses when it wishes to uh, remove certain types of speech and information, ideas and opinions uh, from social media and sometimes more broadly from the internet itself. And of course, this type of, this type of censorship reached a new height uh, during the pandemic in 2020 and 2021, when the CDC and the Surgeon General's office, as well as the White House, began issuing thousands of demands to social media companies to remove so-called misinformation regarding the efficacy of vaccines, um, regarding the origins of the coronavirus, um, and numerous other uh, claims, opinions, and sometimes factual and medical information regarding treatments for the coronavirus, uh, how it spread through populations, and how other countries were responding to it, and even the types of public policies that the, gov that the states and the federal government ought to consider uh, in response to the pandemic. This was widespread. We've learned since from the Twitter files, as well as litigation, that there were numerous government offices coordinating um, to send demands uh, to, every, to all of the major social media networks, sometimes focusing on specific speakers whom they wished to be deplatformed. Um, the, the Biden administration identified what it called a dirty dozen list of uh, persons that it claimed were spreading coronavirus misinformation and that, in their view, uh, ought to be removed from the internet. Um, it, also, it also targeted specific posts, certain types of claims. Uh, the lab leak claim uh, comes to mind. Um, and all other aspects uh, of ideas, and in some cases, information, that simply contradicted the administration's policies and beliefs uh, with respect to the coronavirus and the policy response to it. But as I said, this phenomenon is not limited to social media. And I'll give you one example. Um, around the same time, but not dealing with the pandemic, um, the New York Department of Financial Services uh, began targeting insurance companies uh, regulated by the state, which is to say all of the nation's largest insurance companies, um, to urge them to drop uh, from insurance um, what they describe, what, what the, what the uh, agency described as firearms promotion organizations. Their target, of course, was the NRA. And the pressure worked. The NRA was dropped by its largest, by, by its primary insurer, and it's had difficult subsequently, uh, difficulty subsequently obtaining insurance for its basic business operations. Um, that, that, that is currently being not, uh, litigated in a case called Volo. And while I'm not counsel to the NRA in that case, I will disclose that I am outside counsel to the NRA. But these examples from social media, from the economic sphere, these are just the things we know about. And by all indications, they're just the tip of the iceberg. One of the major problems, uh, one of the major aspects of this problem is that censorship by proxy by and large occurs in the shadows. Of course, there have been public statements by the president, 
uh, and by the president's press secretary, urging social media companies to deplatform certain types of speech. But so much, so many of these communications are made directly to the social media companies themselves, through portals, through emails, phone calls, and in many cases, through meetings that are organized between government actors such as the FBI and officials at the social media companies. None of this is open to the public, and so the public it doesn't have an understanding of the way that the government, by exerting this sort of pressure, uh, is acting to influence public debate on important policy issues. So why has this all come to a head now? Well, I think there are a few reasons for that. One, of course, is simply the rise of social media. There's less intermediation to speech, and therefore there is more speech on a broader array of topics, and simply more noise and more uh, whatever type of speech that one might disfavor, um, its quantity has increased astronomically. And so from the government's point of view, there are simply more targets. A second reason, I think, is the concentration of service providers, not only in the social media space, but in the financial space as well. Think about banks, for example. Many years ago, uh, most banking customers were served by local banks that didn't necessarily have much interaction with the, the regulators in Washington, D.C. Today, when, so, when you have large national banks that serve such a substantial proportion of Americans for their banking services, there now is a point of leverage that government regulators can access to reach all kinds of different, all kinds of different customers. And so there really is sort of a one-stop shop or a several-stop shop uh, for the government to be able to exert force in this fashion. And of course, these larger organizations, whether they're social media companies or financial institutions, they're used to dealing with the government, and they, of course, have teams of officials who interact with their counterparts in government on a regular basis. And that goes into another phenomenon, which is the increasing pervasiveness of regulation across the economy. The more power the government actors have, the more leverage they have to be able to compel uh, private entities to act. And that's especially true where regulation is pervasive, such as in the financial sector. And then finally, and I think it shouldn't be discounted, officials have simply learned that censorship by proxy works. That was the lesson of Operation Choke Point, in which large numbers of businesses lost their access to banking services. And it's the lesson that we've seen since 2017, uh, when government requests have led to the deplatforming uh, of many people using social media, uh, as well as to the suppression of many genres of speech. The government knows that if it asks for social media companies to do something, not always, but frequently, they will be inclined to act. So why is this a problem? One could argue, as the administration has, as, as well as its supporters, that what we're talking about here is misinformation, disinformation, people simply misleading the public, and in some cases, criminal or other types of unlawful behavior. And that may well be true in some instances. But of course, in the United States, we don't have a ministry of truth, and it's not difficult to find examples of speech that the government sought to suppress that later turned out to have a kernel of truth to it, if not being entirely true. That will include, of course, certain types of claimed election misinformation um, in the run-up to the 2020 election, and it includes as well much of the early commentary on the coronavirus pandemic, including regarding its origins, and in some instances, the efficacies of vaccines. The vaccines, of course, were a modern marvel, but it doesn't mean at the same time that they were infallible. The government, however, drew little distinction between those types of criticism in its request to social media networks to remove content that argued, for example, that the vaccines did not always prevent infection, or that they wouldn't necessarily always prevent the spread of the disease. First and foremost, this has an obvious impact on our rights, and the First Amendment is the one that comes to mind. Everybody agrees and recognizes that the government can't and shouldn't impose prior restraints on speech consistent with the First Amendment. And there's a good reason for that. 
We have a culture here, free and uninhibited speech, that informs every aspect of our lives and our democracies. This is how we reach decisions, it's how the public informs itself, and it's how people think about public policies, assess different options, and ultimately decide on the effectiveness of their government and their choice of leaders. But it's not just the First Amendment that's being impaired. Um, we've also seen the threat to Second Amendment rights. I gave the example of the New York uh, financial regulators and, that, and the targeting uh, of, of so-called gun advocacy organizations. And I think what this demonstrates is that the government can use this type of leverage, censorship by proxy, to really impair any sort of right. It doesn't simply have to be speech rights. If somebody is engaging in conduct that the government disfavors, whether or not that conduct is unlawful, the government has the leverage to deplatform and otherwise punish that speaker and thereby curtail our most basic associational and expressive rights, uh, as well as our rights to engage in any type of conduct that might be disfavored by the, by, by the government. And, what's, and, and the problem here is that this sort of leverage allows the government to do what, what would be forbidden if the government attempted to do it directly. The government can't, of course, simply uh, stifle the speech of advocacy organizations because it disagrees with the positions that they're pressing. But what it can do and what it has done to date is operate by proxy to limit and restrict the speech of those entities so that they're in part removed uh, from the public debate and are unable to pursue their advocacy objectives. Now, of course, there's also an impact on civil discourse. The public has a right to information and people have a right to listen. And the government is exercising, when it uses censorship by proxy, an influence over the views, opinions, ideas, and information that can be aired and that can be discussed in public. It can shut down entire sides of a debate. This is bad in and of itself because it is an unseen, a hidden influence on the course of public debate that may mislead the public about what it is people believe and ultimately what it is that's true and what it is the government is doing and whether the government is right or wrong uh, in its views. But it also has secondary effects. By stifling debate in this fashion, the government can lead to paranoia, people who think their speech is being, uh, is being restricted, when in fact, maybe it isn't, and maybe nobody is listening because their speech is not valuable. It can lead to conspiracy theories, both about what the government is doing and why the government is doing it. We saw this with respect to speech regarding the origins of the coronavirus. As the government exercised a heavy hand with respect to the lab leak theory, it led many to speculate that perhaps the US government was involved uh, in the development of the coronavirus pandemic. A factually unfounded claim, but one that from a conspiratorial mindset makes some sense if that is the genre of speech that the government is targeting. And of course, this type of censorship leads to radicalism. People who hold heterodox ideas don't simply abandon those ideas because they might get pushed off of the major social media platforms. Not only do they become conspiratorial, but in many cases they migrate to minor platforms, to private forums, to mailing lists, where they find themselves in an echo chamber with other people who hold, their view, who hold the same views and who simply one up one another in their radicalism and extremism. We've seen this not only with respect to pandemic-related speculations, but also with respect to foreign policy and other types of extremism, domestically and foreign. Finally, all of this affects the conduct of our democracy. As I mentioned, it affects the way that we talk about and debate public policies. It affects the information that we assess when considering policies. But even worse is that this type of censorship by proxy simply circumvents the democratic, the democratic process. None of this has been legislated. There's not a law that you can point to that gives government officials this type of authority. Even worse, this authority is being exercised in a free-floating manner based on the discretions, views, and opinions of the government officials who are exercising this power and seeking to remove content from the internet. And it's actually worse in the sense that the conduct that is being targeted by these actions 
is conduct that in nearly all instances is lawful. In other words, there's no law prohibiting having a wrong idea or stating an incorrect fact. And yet, those sorts of, those, and yet that sort of speech is being curtailed by the government along with facts that are maybe merely debatable uh, or opinions that simply may contradict the government's policies and points of view. This is what happens when the government can leverage its powers to do things and curtail and curtail rights that are otherwise beyond its powers. Finally, there's no accountability to any of this. As I said, this occurs in the shadows. If the public agrees or disagrees with what the public is doing in this regard, if people wish to defend their rights, there's the fundamental hurdle that nobody knows the full scope of what it is government actors are doing. There's nothing, there's no policy document, regulation, there's simply nothing that one can point to and say, this is wrong, I disagree with this, or you shouldn't be doing this. Or in some instances, there's no ability to know, I was deplatformed because a government official demanded that. And therefore, there's no ability to obtain relief in court. So what to do about this? I've seen, and I think there are about three different genres of responses to the phenomenon of censorship by proxy. The first, and the one that's, I, I think, made the greatest inroads to date, is simply litigation. The Supreme Court has recognized for many years that government coercion uh, to restrict speech uh, violates the First Amendment. The seminal case, of course, is Bantam Books versus Sullivan, which involved uh, threats of criminal, uh, criminal prosecution by the Rhode Island Commission to encourage morality in youth. Uh, that was regarding certain novels that the state believed may have been obscene. Um, and of course, booksellers who re and book distributors who received those threatening letters were deterred from selling their books within the state of Rhode Island, notwithstanding that the commission itself had no legal enforcement authority whatsoever. As I said, the court recognized that that violated the First Amendment. In other cases, the court has recognized that s significant encouragements by the government upon a private actor may convert that private actor's actions into state action, in other words, into government action, that would then be subject to the normal limitations on government action, which would include the First Amendment. These are the types of theories that underlie the suit Missouri versus Biden, which is now before the Supreme Court under the title um, Murthy versus Missouri. The claims in that case involve government, government censorship by proxy of social media, primarily but not only concerning the coronavirus pandemic. The, the plaintiffs in that case, which include states as well as a number of private individuals uh, whose social media activities were restricted, were able to obtain discovery and obtained a vast wealth of information about the government's censorship campaign requests that were made to deplatform specific speakers, posts that, were, that the government urged to be withdrawn, um, and entire topics uh, that the government, and, and, and modes of opinion and, and factual assertions that the government simply requested be removed from social media networks, and, that the, and, and as well as communications asking the social media networks to, to revise their content moderation policies so as to preemptively block this, these types of targeted speech. The plaintiffs in Missouri versus Biden were able to obtain an injunction from the district court that was very far reaching, uh, including not only them, but any types of activities by three government entities, the White House, the FBI, and the Surgeon General's office um, that sought to encourage or coerce social media companies uh, to violate the First Amendment. Uh, with respect to any users on those platforms and with respect to any social media platform whatsoever. The government managed to obtain a stay of that injunction recently by the Supreme Court, which also agreed to hear the case in its current term. The issues in the case are complicated, but it fundamentally comes down to the question of what degree of government pressure suffices to transform a content decision made by a social media network into government action that violates the First Amendment. And there isn't a lot of case law in that area. 
There's also a significant issue in the case with respect to the extent of the remedy. The government complains before the Supreme Court that both the nature of liability and the breadth of the, uh, and the, of the remedy effectively prohibit the government from so much as speaking with social media networks. For example, to advise them that certain speech might be criminal uh, or criminally fraudulent, for example, uh, or, that, or that it might cause widespread public harm and that the social media networks themselves may wish to consider that as they make their own decisions. Litigation, for this reason, has a number of complications and uncertainties, and I'm sure we'll discuss uh, as we go forward uh, in this event uh, some of the aspects and some of the complications of the Missouri litigation. But suffice it to say that litigation is not and cannot be a silver bullet for the reason that I said earlier. So much of this activity occurs in the dark and the people targeted simply don't know. What they may know is that a post has been removed or that their account is, is deactivated. They have no way of knowing that the government was involved in that decision, and if so, in what manner it was involved. And so it's a very difficult thing for an, indi for an individual faced with those circumstances to go into court and simply speculate that the government was the one behind it. Those types of cases, in all likelihood, will be and have been dismissed at the earliest stages of litigation, even before the plaintiff can obtain any sort of discovery that might be able to substantiate his or her claims. The second type of, the second type of policy response that's been put forward is legislation, specifically legislation that bans the government from undertaking this type of activity. The difficulty with legislation is that it's very easy to describe censorship by proxy in the abstract, but it's incredibly difficult to describe what exactly would be covered by a prohibition. As we saw in the through the Twitter files, as well as the evidence in the Missouri case, the government very rarely makes explicit threats with respect to content removal, uh, content removal requests. Sometimes it simply just says, you should be aware of this. Sometimes there's no request at all. It simply provides factual information. For example, that certain accounts might be bots and, not not, and don't correspond to any human beings, or that some bots may be part of a network that is being operated by a, a foreign country. This is information, it's not a request. The government's information might be right or wrong, and the social media networks might or might not operate on it. Um, but ultimately, at least going by the face of these requests, it is the choice of the social media networks themselves. And indeed, the evidence in the Missouri case indicates that the social media networks only, uh, only, uh, only agree to approximately half uh, of the government's requests to remove content. And so it's difficult to say exactly what, it, what genre of, cover, of, of co, uh, excuse me, of conduct by government actors one would prohibit through, through, through legislation. Because if it's coercion, well, we see very little coercion, at least on the face of the requests. And as I said, many of them are informational. If it's merely making suggestions or providing information, well, that surely cuts too broadly because the social media networks may want to know, for example, if certain posts uh, are tied up in fraud and are part of fraudulent schemes, if they otherwise violate criminal laws, um, or that people are being misled on their networks, or that other of their moderation policies are implicated based on facts that the government may have in its possession. The social media, the social media networks, as well as other service providers, have a right to listen to the government if they want the information. And so anything that would ban the government from providing that sort of information may well raise its own First Amendment uh, issues. Finally, there's the proposal that we put forward in our Cato paper, and it takes a very different approach from litigation as well as legislation. Our focus is simply transparency. We know the government is undertaking these actions, and we know that it's very difficult to draw a clear line be between what, what everybody agrees ought to be prohibited, or at least what many agree ought to be prohibited, as against what many agree is a legitimate use of, gov of the government's ability to provide information, to speak, and in some instances to exercise its bully pulpit. What we, pro what we, what we propose is simply radical transparency. The paper lays out a, 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 a system by which government officials that make requests, and requests could be suggestions, 
all the way through to coercion. It requires that government officials who make these types of requests simply report it to the Office of Management and Budget, which would then publish them for, uh, quickly in a centralized repository that is de-identified so that people aren't being doxxed, um, but that provides a window to the public as well as to targeted individuals about how it is the government is exercising this power, what speech it is targeting, and the frequency with which it's doing it. The proposal that we put forward is modeled on other government, go government transparency measures, including FOIA and the Privacy Act, and includes the same types of redactions to, pr to protect confidential government information uh, that are applied in those acts. So these are time-tested protections that ensure that the government's legitimate interests with respect to its information are observed. At the same time, we also propose that, the, that as possible, the individuals who are targeted by government, uh, by government censorship by proxy receive notifications so that they can connect what's happened to them to both the de-identified public reports um, as well as ultimately to the government actions that cause them to be deplatformed or to otherwise have their speech restricted. In terms of the mechanism, uh, including the centralized administration by OMB, the proposal is modeled off of ordinary government, uh, ordinary government reporting mechanisms that apply to federal employees across the administrative state. And so the burden would be very low. Um, in our view, um, reports of this sort could be made to the Office of Management and Budget in, the, in, the, in, in a matter of a minute or two through a centralized web portal uh, operated by that agency. And it should be easy, based on experience, for the Office of Management and Budget to provide those reports online and make them available to the public in short order, uh, certainly no longer than a week after they've been provided uh, to the agency. The benefits of transparency are several fold. One, it gives us an idea of what the problem is. If there's going to be some type of legislative approach that's more nuanced than a ban, we, as well as Congress, need to have an understanding of the scope of the problem and how the government is exercising this power. And to date, that's something that we do not have. Second, transparency and simply the sunshine of public attention is itself a deterrent. If you look through the discovery materials in the, in the Missouri litigation, many of the requests that were made to social media networks were, and I don't use this word lightly, ridiculous. The White House and other, other government actors were jawboning social media networks to, review, to remove information and opinions that were simply inconvenient to the administration or potentially politically damaging. And I think everybody would agree that that is simply an improper use of government force. But what's important is that we've seen in the past that when these types of abuses come to light, they tend to stop because the government officials depend on, be, on the ability to operate in the shadows to make these kinds of untenable requests and to wield their power uh, in this improper manner. Simply requiring that these types of requests be disclosed to the public may well curtail the worst abuses and force the government to think through more clearly how it is exercising this power and to limit uh, the, way, the way in which it does so so as to better respect rights or at the very least avoid political embarrassment. Finally, we propose an enforcement mechanism for this disclosure regime. The government, uh, government actors are subject to uh, you know, enforcement penalties, for example, for violations of the Hatch Act, which, put, which uh, prohibits certain types of politicking on the job. Our proposal would apply the same types of penalties to failure to report uh, requests uh, to undertake censorship by proxy. We would, we would combine this with a six-year statute of limitations so that no government actor could feel that he would simply be shielded by the current administration, and so there would always be the risk that failure to report might lead to liability in the future uh, when there's a new administration in office. Ultimately, the idea of our proposal is that by shining a light on these things, we can put together more tailored policy responses, we can have greater accountability and oversight as to the government's exercise of its powers, Congress will be able to do its job, and the public and targeted individuals can understand what's happening to them and how the government is operating and how it is influencing 
public debate, uh, as well as uh, public discussion of its own policies and operations. So with that, I thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, sig significant explanation of the paper, and please do, uh, I said, read it. It's online and available outside. Um, a quick, a couple questions from me, and then we've got some questions online, and, and we'll also be able to send some uh, microphones around the room. Um, so just for, for what it's worth, if you're thinking about a question right now, um, online questions, you can join the conversation and submit questions directly on the event webpage, Facebook and YouTube, and on X, formerly known as Twitter, um, using the hashtag um, Cato, uh, hashtag Cato 1A. So feel free to submit those questions right now um, as we, as I have a little bit of a conversation with Andrew before we start. Um, uh, one quick question, and just to note this, is in the paper, while the proposal you've just mentioned is one that uh, is legislative in nature, in theory this could also be undertaken through uh, executive action if you had an executive that was serious about providing uh, radical transparency to the public. Is that right? That's exactly right. Um, the president wields broad authority over the regulation of the agencies in the administrative state, and it would be within the power uh, of the president to simply establish this type of reporting program via executive order. Uh, nothing, present, nothing prevents the president from doing it tomorrow, and that even includes, in a general sense, the, the enforcement provisions that we've proposed. Um, they could be. Uh, done through a government certification that would be uh, undertaken by relevant government officials. Um, in the same way, the same type of proposal would be readily adaptable to state governments as well. Yes, the only prohibition is their unwillingness to give up this informal course of power that they wield, essentially. That's exactly right. I mean, when you think about it, what is the objection to transparency of the government's exercise of power. I mean, it's typically what we expect and demand in every other aspect of government operations. We have no thing in this country that's no, uh, as secret law. Um, and yet that's effectively what's being wielded here because the government is leveraging the laws that are on the books to reach beyond them and address conduct that hasn't been the subject of any law. And so if the government is going to undertake that type of leveraging, you would think uh, it's the kind of thing that everybody would expect would be transparent and you know, would be made available to the public so the public can understand what it is the government is doing and where the government thinks the guardrails are. Um, but in the months since we've put forward this proposal, um, the only objection that we've seen to it is simply that the government officials wielding this power might not like it. Um, they might be embarrassed. It might curtail their ability uh, to, to make requests that in some cases they view as sensitive. Um, but it strikes me that that is not a very persuasive objection, and indeed it only highlights the, the need for this type of approach. Wonderful. Um, with that, I think we'll open it up to questions uh, from the audience and from online. Um, I'll take one here from our audience and then I'll take one from online. So I think there's one right here. And if you could just uh, an announce your name and affiliation and end with a question. Oh, I think an anonymous speech is a Cato tradition, isn't it? I I'm John Samples. I work here at Cato. Uh, first of all, great paper, great idea. I don't think it's being discussed enough, and there's a problem of getting it out there. But it's a very good uh, paper and, and worth reading. I want to ask you about, you've discussed briefly and somewhat obliquely, that you recognize exceptions to your transparency regime. And it makes, you know, I think everyone can agree that there's a set of uh, cases where we would agree we don't want the, the government official doesn't has, have to disclose. It relates to trials, law enforcement, and uh, certainly some national security. I want to ask you about a particular case that I believe happened and get your response to it and whether your regime, your transparency regime, would cover it or not. So uh, in... Um, October of 2020, the New York Post ran a story about a laptop that was thought to be, it was thought and subsequently was found to be belonging to Hunter Biden that contained, and they drew implications about that for the Democratic presidential candidate. About two days before that story ran, an FBI agent said to Facebook employees that there was a Russian disinformation story about to break and they should be on the lookout for it. So my question to you is, now the other thing we know that because about two years later, Mark Zuckerberg said, 
that this happened. Now, let's just assume that he's telling the truth, and I'm not sure there's been any serious doubts about that, um, but let's assume he is. Uh, under your regime, your transparency regime, would that FBI agent have to disclose what he said to Facebook, which after all seems to have led Facebook to essentially not suppress that speech, but to uh, fix it so no one could link to the story on Facebook. Three billion people, 200 million Americans. Um, and that linking is not, some people think that's not a, a limit on speech, but I notice you mentioned the rights of listeners. And so many, many people that might have known about that story probably did not uh, because of Facebook's decision. Now, just to, to finish, I mean, a couple of things. It seems to me that there's two things you can say why it shouldn't be part of transparency. A, it wasn't coercive by the government agent in question. A second possibility is that we don't have to worry about this because Mr. Zuckerberg has uh, voluntarily disclosed it. So I'm, uh, I don't know. I think this is a tough case in some respects, but you may not view it that way, and I wanted to get your thinking on it. I do not view it that way. Um, the great thing about a transparency-based approach as opposed to a prohibition-based approach is that it can be over-inclusive. Um, there's not as much of an imperative to define coercion with uh, precision because nothing is being prohibited, it's merely being disclosed. Um, and our, under our proposal, any type of request or encouragement by the government uh, to suppress content uh, would have to be reported. Um, and we, we don't have any exceptions to that. It's, and, and so we're able to define what is included within that reporting requirement exceptionally broadly because, again, it's merely reporting and the government can undertake whatever activities it's otherwise able to undertake. And the fact that that may be from time to time over-inclusive uh, is certainly not a vice. Um, and, you know, that's the, you know, rather than take an exception-based approach, our, our proposal attempts to cover the field and then allow the government to redact information from what's publicly disclosed based on the traditional types of redactions that apply to FOIA requests and in some instances to Privacy Act requests. So the government isn't forced to show all of its cards about necessarily why it's making the request or what information is behind that, but it is required, it would be required to disclose that the request was made. And I'll take, I'll combine two questions from online, speaking to the question of breadth and how, how, how widely we're trying to cast the net here. There's two questions here. First, about um, mostly in the conversation and in the paper, we're discussing the executive branch. Um, so that's been the, the main sort of gist of the, the, the talk today. And, um, and so the question is, is, what about other branches of government? You mentioned state, for instance, state governments as well. What about the legislature? What about the courts? And similarly, to combine the two questions, what about how do we how does this relate to other countries? Uh, with the EU being particularly aggressive in this realm of trying to regulate speech. Obviously, we're focused on the U.S. in this paper, but just to sort of combine, talk about the breadth of the way this could apply. How do you think this applies to other parts of the U.S. government? And then, how does foreign governments? How does this interact with foreign governments? As we, so far as the legislative branch is concerned, as we describe in the paper, uh, Congress certainly could adopt a similar approach in its own rules, um, but it would be very difficult um, for, you know, there are different considerations with respect to Congress because, of course, members of Congress aren't exercising enforcement authority, and so they lack the ability to make the precise types of threats that we've seen, as well as implicit threats that we've seen from the executive branch. The legislature is the branch that writes the laws. It's not the one that's carrying them into execution. Um, that said, we have seen um, a lot of jawboning um, by the, by members of Congress, and in some cases by congressional committees, um, speaking out against speech that they disagree with or view as incorrect in some respect, uh, putting pressure on the social media companies to restrict certain types of speech, and in some cases, uh, threatening legislation. Um, the problem, of course, is that Congress and members of Congress have the right to threaten legislation um, that's what they do to all of us uh, when they come forward with their legislative proposals. Um, and Congress has the right uh, 
like it or lump it, um, to look at uh, current events and how things are operating in the real world and to fashion legislative responses to those things um, as it views appropriate to the circumstances. Um, so there could certainly be, there could certainly be uh, something that would, that would regulate in some manner or require transparency of these types of requests made by members of Congress, but I think some of the considerations at play are a little bit different. As for other countries, I don't think there's any reason that they couldn't adopt a similar type of transparency regime. But, you know, to some extent, a lot of the speech, you know, when we're talking about U.S. affairs and U.S. policies and U.S. Uh, political campaigns, um, it relates more to the interests of the United States and isn't necessarily being regulated uh, or being targeted uh, by foreign countries. Um, you know, we certainly have the ability to set an example for the world by adopting a transparency regime that brings these sorts of things into light and sets a model, um, but ultimately we don't really have the power to force other countries uh, to follow that approach. Um, one other question online um, asks about the specific nature of the penalties you describe. Um, so it asks about what penalties should the government or especially the, the individuals who might be engaging in inappropriate use of, of, of their, their uh, of government pressure, what, what effect should, when it's found out, let's say through a trans your transparency-based regime, what should the impact be to the person, the individual, the state actor who has done that misdeed? Sure. Um, let me take that in, in two steps. So under our proposal, the penalties would be on government officials who fail to report uh, demands and, and requests uh, made to third party providers. Um, and the penalties there mirror the ones in the Hatch Act, which include employment penalties um, and financial penalties uh, as well. And I believe uh, potentially imprisonment, although I believe that's, that's very, uh, very rare. Um, in a broader sense, um, currently, there aren't really any penalties on the books uh, for government officials undertaking this type of conduct. Um, theoretically, they might be subject to an injunction for violation of the First Amendment, um, but in general, they're not going to be subject to uh, monetary penalties or, or any other sort of um, any, 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 any other sort of remedy. Um, that's something that Congress may wish to consider in the future. Uh, but currently, as I understand it, the laws in the book simply don't reach this sort of conduct. Got it. Um, another question from online is uh, a question about your view on the, sort of the threat between misinformation versus censorship and essentially asking what can the government do about what they view to be misinformation on social media without running afoul of the First Amendment or jawboning. Well, the government has a great deal of power at hand to deal with disinformation, uh, you know, to the extent that one views that as a proper function of government, which many people, of course, do not. Um, but to the extent that the government is going to do that, I mean, first and foremost, the government has its bully pulpit. The government has the ability to publish its own information, rebutting claims that are made by others, um, and setting forth the facts as it understands them and attempting to substantiate them based on the facts and the resources that are available to the government. In other words, fight speech with more speech. Um, the government also has the ability, and in much the same mode, um, to explain to third party, to, to social media providers, what it believes is misinformation or disinformation and harmful. Um, service providers, um, including social media networks, you know, do have content moderation policies, and in some instances, they do seek to restrict, for their own reasons, uh, certain types of misinformation. And to the extent that they wish to listen to what the government has to say uh, with respect to those topics, um, the government certainly can offer them that type of information so that they can make their own informed decisions. I had a question um, getting into the weeds a bit about um, the, the Fifth Circuit and its view um, on how sort of to handle that line between, uh, if, we, if you think about litigation as being the way that, say, that some folks would say this should be handled, um, looking at the Fifth Circuit, that you mentioned how there's often look, a look, looking for a clear causal connection of this government communication led to this content being deplatformed or suppressed. And that's sort of the traditional coercion-based approach. But the Fifth Circuit largely eschewed that kind of direct one line to one-to-one -to -one, um, comparison instead was looking at sort of the sum total of 
of, of government communication. So not saying that any individual communication was coercive, but when you look at the sum total of, of communications being um, you know, given to social media companies, that, in their words, imparted a lasting influence on the platform's moderation decisions, or that it, quote, um, ensured that the platform's decisions were not made by independent standards, but were instead marred by modifications from government officials. Um, so what is your view on this sort of broader, significant encouragement view of job owning? And also importantly, what do you, th if, if you wish to hazard a guess, what do you think the Supreme Court will have to say on it? Because clearly they will have to consider the Fifth, the Fifth Circuit's opinion. It's always a complicated task to attempt to disentangle um, private decisions and, from, and, and state action when the two are, in some sense, intertwined. And the evidence in the Missouri case indicated that the government was simply directing a barrage of requests and demands um, to the social media networks, uh, sometimes in public, uh, from the bully pulpit of the White House, uh, and many, many, many more times in private, through email messages, through phone calls, um, through meetings, um, through outreach by government actors in a variety of different agencies and offices. And it's difficult to tell, uh, it, it's as I said, it's difficult to disentangle, you know, to what extent the decisions that were made by the social media networks were in fact their own decisions versus to what extent they were motivated by the government. In some instances, there was a one-to-one -one correlation where the government requested a specific piece of content or a specific person uh, to be deplatformed, and the social media networks followed that request. Although, again, there may still be a question as to what extent the government's action was coercive as opposed to simply being something that prompted the social media networks to make their own choice. But the Fifth Circuit, as you, as you explained, did look at this more holistically, looking at the entire field of government communications, particularly regarding the pandemic, uh, as well as some election-related speech. Um, and I think recognized this as a government, effectively a government program that had gone off the rails. And so it made sense to look at it from a programmatic approach rather than one that was necessarily tailored to specific instances of content removal. I think that was a fair and realistic appraisal of the situation. If you look at it from the point of view of the people who were being arguably coerced, that is the social media networks, you're not talking about a single email. You're talking about the full field of government force that was brought to bear upon them. And so it wouldn't make sense to simply disregard that broader context and look at everything individually. At the same time, it raises a very difficult question as to how exact, you know, what exactly is the line when you look at things with that type of breadth between coercion and merely encouragement or suggestion or providing information, all things that the government may do in general uh, without violating the First Amendment or without convert and without converting private entities like social media networks into state actors when they act on that information. And I think the Fifth Circuit's approach to that, while realistically reflecting the situation, may well give the Supreme Court pause. Because, it's, because, and I think this is apparent on the face of the Fifth Circuit's decision, as well reasoned as it was, it's very difficult to draw a clear line here. And ultimately, the injunction that the Fifth Circuit partially upheld prohibits government officials from violating the First Amendment through these sorts of activities. And it can be very unclear from the point of view of a government official what type of request, what type of information, what type of outreach might well violate that prohibition. Um, and so there are possibly insuperable line drawing problems here if you look at this from a programmatic point of view, because again, you're talking about a variety of different contacts, contacts that have to them a variety of different content, different things the government was asking for, different ways it was putting its requests, and different types of threats or implied threats or sometimes suggested threats or implicit threats. Um, it's difficult to take that all at once and say, this amounts to unlawful coercion or significant encouragement because you're involved with the, the platform's decision making. And then think how that applies to other cases and how it ought to regulate government actors going forward so the government officials know what they can lawfully do and what they can lawfully say and what falls on the other side of the line.
So that's going to give the court pause. And it may well be that the court, re that, that the court ultimately settles on a narrower view of things. When you have that type of one-to-one -one correlation, when there's a closer nexus, when there's an express threat that is attached to a specific request, that's something the courts can deal with and draw a clear line. But when you're dealing with the greater breadth, it becomes a lot fuzzier and a lot less clear about where exactly the law reaches. And finally, I mean, there is also the issue of remedies. I mean, the remedy in this case, uh, that is the injunction, extended beyond the particular plaintiffs in the case to all users of social media networks and all social media networks. And the government does have a point that an injunction of this breadth that covers that effectively tells government officials don't violate the First Amendment with respect to anybody, anywhere, um, is kind of what lawyers call like a follow the law injunction. In other words, it doesn't give them specific information about what it is they need to do to comply with the injunction. And so from the government's point of view, there is certainly a problem here about how it is it's supposed to uh, ensure you know what what type of rule it is it's supposed to follow and how and from the court's point of view there's going to be a question well how do you define that what is you know what do you if there is going to be an injunction what does it say so that it's something that government officials can actually follow uh, you know if they intend to undertake that in good faith so similar to the prohibition the legislative pro prohibition approach the line drawing question once again rears its head and how do the courts define that line just it's a, it's a similar problem. Um, the only, only, only difference being that it's a court rather than the legislature. Um, and so with that, we are, over, we are just over time. So I think with that, we will wrap our event. Thank you to, the, to everyone who's asked the question. Thank you for the questions I was unable to get to. And thank you, Andrew, for uh, this great discussion. Thank you. Thank you all.